Okay, hey everybody. My name is Juan, as he said, and today's presentation is named Grass, Gas, and Biomass. So we're going to be looking at the effects of ranch land management practices on plant traits and greenhouse gas emission potential in dominant species of grasses at Buck Island Ranch. This is a project developed in unison with LTAR, Alltech Feed Labs, and Archival Biological Station. Oops. All right, let's get going. So grazing lands are about one third of all terrestrial non-ice covered land, and they provide very important ecosystem services, supporting habitat for wildlife, provisioning food, and regulating services since they're the first in all global carbon stocks above and below ground. Now, yes, these lands do sequester and hold carbon, but livestock is still a main source of greenhouse gas emissions. And all these services are affected by ranch land management. So, at Archbold, we, we uh, set in two different types of pastures. We have improved and semi-native pastures. The improved pastures have a lot more ditching. They are seeded and they are fertilized more often. They also change in um, cow stock rates. Well, as the semi-natural pastures are less regulated, but they have a higher biodiversity. So there's more types of plants that grow within the same area. Now, prescribed fire is also an important management tool that we use. Usually people do business as usual. It's an old school practice and you just burn the whole pasture all at once. Huge expanses of land burned all together. Whereas now we're trying a new alternative management called patch burn grazing. And in there, instead of burning it all at the same time, you're burning sectors of each pasture on different years so as to make a mosaic of forage for the cows and other animals. Now you may be asking why we want to do that. And it's done a lot in the Midwest, but it provides a uh, more place for different species to set in and different habitats for a higher diversity of animals in there. So plant responses and functional agroecology. And functional agroecology is a fairly new field and it's focused in understanding ecosystem services by using plant traits as a medium to better understand the effects of management practices and environmental factors on plant communities. Now, plant traits are the measurable phenotypic characteristics of a plant. And these are just a couple of different articles that I've gathered regarding the new upcoming field of agroecology. So it's a way to understand our system and plant traits provide the framework for that. Once again, uh, another definition for plant traits are biological characteristics of plants species that respond to dominant processes in the ecosystem. This was done by Kamen et al. and a couple of other papers I read. So the traits that we will be measuring today are gonna be specific leaf area, which is the scanned leaf area divided by the dry mass, uh, leaf dry matter content or LDMC, which is the leaf dry mass divided by the wet mass. And then we will also be measuring plant height and a couple of le leaf parameters, including length of the leaf, uh, width of the leaf and height. So you might be asking yourself, why, how do these plants change in all that? And it's all due to the leaf economic spectrum um, leaf economic spectrum, you can see in this picture, I have two leaves, one on the left and one on the right. The one on the left has a very slow photosynthetic rate. Uh, it's less nutritious, its lifespan is longer, and it's got higher mass per area. So it's thick and dense leaf. Um, so they're meant to stay on the, on the plant for much longer than the leaf on the right, which is a fast photosynthetic rate. It's more nutritious and its lifespan is very short. So they're meant to be shed every year or so. Now, when it comes to forage digestibility, we did this through the Altec Feed Laboratories, whose mission is to improve health and performance of people, animals, and plants through nutrition and scientific innovation. They have an in vitro fermentation model, and I'll refer to that as IFM, um, which is basically a lab simulated stomach of a cow. Now, the rumen, the first stomach in a cow before the reticulum, is what we're going to be uh, examining. Uh, and it basically uses this bacteria to digest or partially digest plant matter. Now, from that uh, scan, we got different types of variables, including volatile fatty acids, or VFAs, which are short hydrocarbon chains that result as a main source of energy for ruminants, or cows, in this case. Uh, we will also be getting true dry matter digestibility, or TDMD, which is just about how much of that plant matter got digested by the bacteria within the rumen, and then we'll also be getting greenhouse gas emission 
numbers, including carbon dioxide and methane. And I just want to clarify that these carbon dioxide and methane are going to be coming from Altic and not from the atmospheric variables that we measure on the ranch. Okay, so we had three objectives or main objectives for this project. The first one being how do pasture types and prescribed fire treatment affect species traits and community trait composition? And we have these three hypotheses. The first one is that a specific leaf area will be higher in improved pastures and higher in recently burned patches. We think this will happen due to the fertilization and the nutritive ash layer that comes from the recently burned patches. Um, as of LDMC or leaf dry matter content, we assume this will be the opposite. So leaf dry matter content will be lower in improved pastures and lower in recently burned patches with the same reasons. And plant height also, we think we're gonna be lower in recently burned patches be because of this recent fire and plants are just starting to produce again. Our second objective goal is how do, does pasture type and prescribed fire treatment affect forest digestibility? or true dramatic digestibility, as well as potential greenhouse gas emissions. So we think the hypotheses are that digestibility will be higher in improved and in more recently burned patches. And we think so because of the same nutrients and fertilizers shooting clays or plant, plant nutritive values. Um, we also think that CO2 and CH4 emissions will both be higher in more recently burned patches and improved pastures. Those have the same reasoning. Um, but we th also think that the uh, digestibility will be lower in subseminated pastures due to the high biodiversity and species composition in there. Now for objective three, our main question is, could these easily measurable traits be used as a good proxy for digestibility, carbon dioxide, and methane emission potential? Now, IFM analyses the, uh, with, is sort of costly, whereas these traits are very easy to measure on the field by one or a couple of people, and you can have results. So if you can tell what's going on just by looking at these simple, easy to measure traits, then that you can learn a lot about the land that you live in. So within those two, our hypotheses are that specific leaf area at both the community and the species level will be positively correlated to digestibility, greenhouse gas emission potential as well. And that LDMC will have the negative effect. So negatively correlated to all those variables. We think so because this ties the two previous objectives together. Um, so we're just going off of the previous two as well. All right, so now we're getting on to the materials and method section. So site location and experiment, uh, this was all done at Archbolt Buck Island Ranch, a 10,500 acre fully operational cattle ranch with about 2,700 cattle head, 500 miles of ditching, and 600 seasonal wetlands spread all throughout. Now, we use the NIFA pasture experiment, which is the National Institute of Food and Agriculture. Um, and if you direct your attention towards the map, we see an area shaded in green, which is the improved sector of it all, and then an area shaded in red, which is the semi-native or semi-natural. Now, within each of those shaded areas, there are eight pastures, and they're each 40 acres. So there's 16 overall, 40 acre pastures, eight improved, eight semi-native. And then within those eight in each, we have also different fire treatments. So once again, if you direct your attention towards the uh, chart, the graph, uh, you'll be able to see that some pastures are fully shaded in green, which is a 2017 burnt year, whereas other ones have 2017, 18, and 19 in the dark blue, yellow, and dark green. So that sets the difference between the treatments, and they're spread all throughout the ranch so that they're very different in the way they behave. All right, so vegetation survey are used to find the abundant species in uh, the pastures. We did so by taking 15 random one meter square plots per pasture, uh, I'm sorry, per sector, and there's three sectors in each pasture, so 45 random one meter square plots per pasture. This predates my time at Archbold since it got started in 2016 as a pre-treatment year, and then went on to 2017, 18, and 19 with the burn years. They collected the percent cover of each species in each plot in order to get a cumulative mean of cover in each pasture type per species. And I'm gonna explain what that means in the next slide. But there's, we came up with 12 semi-native abundant species and then six uh, abundant species in the improved pastures, so 18 overall. Once again, community weighed mean combines community surveys to plant trade data. It's a way to compare different desired traits based on the abundance of the species. So if you look at these two pictures, you'll be able to see that there's four species in each one of them. So that means they have the same biodiversity, 
but the abundance is what changes. So in the picture on the left, we have seven of the taller grass species and then three of the shorter ones, whereas on the one on the right, we have four taller species and then six of the shorter ones, which makes our height, mean height shorter on the right one than on the left one, you know. So based on abundance, once again. Now, when it comes to plant leaf sampling, we measure the 18 most abundant species, which came out to be a total of 704 specimens overall. The way we collected these were by setting a transect in each sector and walking along it, collecting plants from different plots within the same sector. Uh, the plants were dried, ground, and sent for analyses. And before they were dried and ground, they were scanned to see the specific leaf area of it all. Now, if you look at the pictures that I have on the right, you'll see two uh, species. The one on the bottom is Centella asiatica, and that's a very high leaf area leaf. Um, it's, it's very broad and uh, high specific leaf area plants are set to grow in very nutrient rich environments. Um, now the other plant that we have there that looks a little stringier, uh, that is Bahia grass or Paspalum notatum. And that was actually the only abundant species found in both semi-native and uh, improved pastures. Now, once again, we get the leaf wet and dry mass out of that. Uh, we got the plant height, leaf length with an area, the SLA, LDMC, specific leaf area and leaf dry matter content. And then from the IFM results, we got volatile fatty acids, those hydrocarbon chains that get broken down for energy, digestibility, and nutrient values. So for digestibility, we did four random sampling locations per sector. Um, the red dots that, I'm sorry, the black dots that you see are monthly forage quality sampling. Uh, and then we took samples right next to that in the red dots, which are the Altec forage. These are all mixed species and we would collect them in different bags per sector. Uh, now, if you can see in the graph, same thing as the previous one, we have uh, on the patch burn pastures, we tested for 2017, 2018, and 2019. Whereas the full burn pasture, we only tested on one sector since the treatment is supposed to be the same all throughout a full burn pasture. Okay. Statistical analyses that we used. For objective one, we use a linear mixed model or LMM with pasture ID as a random effect. And then we related each plant trait to its pasture type and burn treatment. Now for objective two, we also use a linear mixed model with the same random effects. But in this case, we related CO2 and CH4 emissions to pasture types and burn treatments. And then for objective three, we used a regression analysis. So for example, we got the community weight mean of specific leaf area and we put it as a function of the true dry matter digestibility. All right, so now we're getting on to the results. So the results for objective one, I just want you to look at this graph for a second. It's a box and whisker plot. Uh, the dark line in the middle is going to indicate the median of the values. Then you have the upper quartile and the lower quartile shown in there as well as any stragglers. Um, so in this case, the SLA was significantly affected by the style of pasture. So the specific leaf area of the community weight mean was affected by the style of pasture. We can tell that the improved pastures have a much higher average than the semi-native pastures. Uh, and actually the trends do go up as our hypotheses expected with the recently burned years. So we can tell that the full burn 2017 is a pretty broad range and then uh, patch burn 2017, 2018 and 2019 sort of seem to have an upwards trend, which was less seen in the, in, in the semi-native pastures. Okay, now uh, we have the community weight mean of the leaf dry matter content. Uh, this was done in grams. And it actually is not significantly affected by the style of pasture, which is an unexpected result since we expected it to go in a negative path uh, with the recent burn years. And we can see a very light trend in here, but it's not significant enough to point it out. Now, if we look at the community weight mean on plant height, this is very clear that um, we can see in the improved pastures, the full burn has the highest one. And then as the years increase, uh, the burn years come up, the height seems to be going down, which supports our hypotheses and is significantly related as well. In the semi-native pastures, we see that a little bit less, but there's still somewhat of a trend in there that you can see. Okay, um, 
now for digestibility in greenhouse gas emissions. Now, we are able to see the highest trends in here within true dry matter digestibility on the top left and volatile fatty acids on the top right. Um, however, we do not see strong correlations in carbon dioxide emissions and methane emissions, both on the bottom. So TDMD and VFA tended to be higher in improved and more recently uh, burned pastures. However, they're still non-significant. Now, why are they not significant? This graph was provided by the Forage Evaluation Support Lab at UF, uh, and they tested organic meta digestibility monthly throughout 2019. And we were able to see the highest difference in forage quality um, during the months of May and August. And we did our collecting in the months of October, November, and December, the black box that's on the graph right here. So timing is everything, and it really is in this case. There's a very strong seasonality in forage digestibility. So the new upcoming study should be developed within those couple of months where you see the highest variance. Now for objective three, was SLA, specifically Feria, positively correlated to forage nutritive value in the case of true dry matter digestibility and volatile fatty acid content? Yes, it was. We can see this line that will show us a clear upwards trend of our tests. But in the case of true dry matter digestibility, it only explains 37% of it all. And in the case of the volatile fatty acid, it only explains 27% of it all. So they're not the highest results, the highest correlation, but they're still there and they are significant. So it supports our hypotheses. Now, in the case of greenhouse gas emission potential, we see that same blue line, the clear upwards trend on the case of carbon dioxide, I'm sorry, of methane emissions, uh, but it still only is a 22% explanation for this. Whereas in CO2, we are not able to see the same correlation. And you see some trends, but they are not significant. Now, I mentioned before that the leaf dry matter content and specific leaf area have a negative correlation. So the results that we got from the uh, leaf dry matter content in relation to all of these were the same. We were able to see negative correlations in the case of leaf dry matter content in carbon dioxide, I'm sorry, not in carbon dioxide emissions, but every other one did have a negative correlation. So the results are similar and it supports our hypothesis. So were we right? Was SLA or specific leaf area higher in improved pastures? Yes, it was. Was specific leaf area higher in recently burnt patches? It was not. It was actually the opposite of what we expected. So was plant height lower in recently burned pastures? Yes, it was. Was digestibility, carbon dioxide, and methane higher in improved pastures and recently burned patches? So it was not significant, but we did see some trends. So it's not a complete no. Um, was specific leaf area positively related to digestibility? Yes, it was. And was specific leaf area related to greenhouse gas emissions? Yes, except not with CO2. So CH4, methane, did show a correlation, but carbon dioxide did not. Now, lastly, was leaf dry matter content negatively related to digestibility, carbon dioxide, and methane emissions? Same thing. The only one that was not applicable in that case was carbon dioxide, once again. So there's several benefits to the study, including that functional traits can provide the framework needed to further understand agroecology. Now we're more aware of plant digestion variables after it. We've learned about the plant traits in the agroecosystem, and then this could also potentially lead to changes in ranchers' land management that could even impact their economic output. So if a rancher sees this and realizes that they want to target a specific plant trait response from their plants, they can alter their management practices in order to target that specifically and get the best possible results. Now, the, we, there are a couple of missing analyses and future directions that we could take. Uh, a study including more than the abundant species would be optimal since we would get a really true perspective of what the uh, forage is like at Buck Island Ranch. Then also a nitrogen and phosphorus correlation to traits um, digestibility at the species level is an exam that's missing. And IFM analyses on samples collected in June, like I said before, that is the optimal collection time due to the high variance between both pastures. So lastly, I want to thank you all. Uh, you guys were all really great. Not only the people that I met there, but just Archbold in general and the folks at, Alt at uh, Altec as well. 
you guys all provided a lot of support to me. Greg Sonier had all the guidance that I needed and more. And every single person in these pictures and everybody else played a really important role at my internship in Archbold. So I am eternally grateful. And, you know, let's hang out at some time. <laughs> that's, that's all. Anybody's got any questions? <laughs> see these questions but we do on there. questions yeah, go ahead uh so the first one was was from scott and scott is curious to know if the community way mean better than importance values for grassland studies so i'm sorry is, is it better than what importance values for grassland studies well, the community weight means is a way to look at the whole pasture by itself. So we were targeting that specifically in order to get a broad idea of what the pastures were behaving like and if they had any big differences. Now, if we're looking specifically at like uh, plant responses within the, the species themselves, like I could have compared Paspalum notatum, which was the only abundant species in both improved and semi-native pastures and compare their data within. So getting like a community uh, species, I guess, specific leaf area of Pospalinotatum in improved pastures and then one of just Pospalinotatum in semi-native pastures and see how that could have done. But that's yet to be done and it will be within the upcoming studies. So just, you know, stay tuned. Uh, this was actually a question from Michael Ross, which, which was actually asking whether you tested if Pospalinotatum traits were different between improved and semi-native pasture. And yes. Oh, we did that, and you yeah. initially had that in your presentation, so I'll let you. <laughs> right, yeah, that is correct. We initially did include these slides in the presentation. Uh, let me get over there. But we ended up taking them out. So leaf height and burn year. Well, let me move this over here. How do I do that? OK, so leaf height and burn year do have a very slight difference, but you can see that as time passes, just for Pespalum notatum, uh, the 2017 burn is a lot more normalized. So the values with the 2019 are a lot more different. However, the improved values are lower than the semi-native values. Um, and I also had a couple more slides regarding that. Now this is the Pespalum notatum response to pasture type. And in here, we can see that it is not significantly affected. There is a slight trend but it is not enough to actually call it, you know, the interaction within itself is, um, is significant, but not the treatments themselves. So there's that as well. And I also did compare LDMC. Um, in this case, you can see a lot more outlier values. So these little dots around the graph. Um, and once again, we do see trends, but they're still not significant. So we, we decided to take these out and, and leave them out there. Um, and the last one was a height response. In this case also, we saw, actually in all these cases, we saw that the community weight means portrayed a lot more information and actually it complied with our, with our hypotheses a lot better than just the Pestalum notatum data. So in this case, um, we did see a downward trend in the improved pastures and somewhat of an upward trend in the semi-native, which is also an unexpected result for us. So thank you, Mike. <laughs> Um, next question. So what is the difference in current or historical stocking rates on the pastures? How would that affect your findings? Mm -hmm. So that would affect our findings not only by the herbivory that the cows are eating and how much of that they're eating, but also of how much they're giving up. Now, um, cows also trample on the grass and have some kind of effect on the soils themselves and the plants. So when a plant gets broken, it tends to try to grow a little bit more, a little bit faster to, you know, get back up there. Um, now, as of a true visible relationship, I'm not too sure. Greg or Betsy, could you guys jump in on this one? You want to go, Betsy? Um, so the question was about how stocking rate might affect the results. Yes. I, I do think it could, um, it would stocking rate or higher grazing intensity could speed up nutrient cycling in the 
pastures and potentially result in more nutrients availability to plants and that could increase SLA. Um, but we would have to use the GPS collar data because cattle grazing is very patchy across the pasture, pastures. So we'd kind of have to look at where cattle are spending time in the pastures and then sample in plots where they spend a lot of time versus not much time. So I think that's a really interesting question and we'd like to investigate that further. Um, I also forgot to mention that in all the plant collections that we did for the scanning, we made sure that all the plants were fully hydrated. We were made sure that there was no signs of herbivory so that the plants had full leaves and also they were not too old and not too young. So we try to get like a good balance in there. All right, we have a, a question from Betsy Rothamel. Could nutrients released by burning explain the unexpectedly higher specific leaf area in recently burned pastures? Yeah, so that's what hypothesis is. Um, that exactly that layer of nutrient, of ash nutrients uh, goes down and it improves the growth of, of these new species. So I guess that nutritive value is what makes that all that difference. Um, we also, we assume that with the newer, newly burned patches, we start seeing fairly new plant growth and you know the height should go down with that. I don't know if you guys would like to add anything more to that, Betsy or Greg. Uh, we have a question from Seth. So you understand that the purpose of a specific leaf area is because it's tied to uh, like uh, leaf display efficiency and the nutrient uptake, but he was curious to, uh, how could you explain the purpose of leaf dry matter content, like the dry mass divided by west mass ratio that you calculated? Right, so in Is that it about water content or something else? Yeah, so uh, leaf dry matter content, plants that are high in leaf dry matter content are usually tied to being in a poor nutrient environment. So these plants have to hold on to all they've got as much as possible. Um, they don't have maybe as much water or nutrients, but the plants that have high leaf area, not only are like a broader spread plant leaf, um, but they also have a high water content. So uh, I showed before some scans of Centella asiatica, a, a very broad, like I think it's penny, penny ward. I'm not too sure on that one. Um, and this Pespalum notatum, which are very thin leaves. So Pespalum notatum had the higher LDMC in this case when compared to Centella asiatica. Um, so plants, when, when you dry them out, uh, in the case of Centella asiatica, for example, uh, the plants had so much water content that like the, the, the dry weight was of a mere fraction of the wet weight. Uh, and instead in the plants with higher with higher LDMC, when you dried them out, the plants had a very minimal change within the, those variables. Sorry. All right, we're just going to take one more questions and then move on to the next presentation. So I'm going to go with the first one that appeared. This is a very open-ended question, but do you think you will see any change in in due to self-isolation, meaning possibly less pollution. Oh, that's true. So that might be able to be seen a little bit more within the flux towers that we have at the ranch and at the station. Uh, more, I feel like that would be more of an atmospheric change than a plant trait change. These plant traits respond to mostly to the management practices. So these are very slow processes that have to be put into, I mean, they've been going on since 2016 until until now, and we're seeing responses now, but the, with the upcoming analyses, hopefully we'll be able to see something. Um, when it comes to isolations and pollution levels declining, I mean, I'm happy about it. I hope the plants are happy about it too. 